Hi, everyone. So we can get started today. Uh, I want to officially welcome everyone to the TSP Smart Spaces Boston Design Week webinar, uh, covering what we see as really the next generation of design tools. Our time today uh, will feature Michael O, president and founder of TSP, as well as Aaron Stallings, TSP's director of Smart Spaces. My name is Adam Fisk. I am the director of IT services here at TSP, and we'll be acting kind of as a, your host, ringleader, and everything else of sorts. I will also be joined in later today by Ken and Patrick from Modus VR. And really throughout our time today, we're going to hit on a number of really, really fascinating topics and even some real-time demos of some of the systems we're wanting to show off. And we invite you to really open as many questions as you wish uh, via the Q&A section in your Zoom window. At the end of our time today, we'll be answering as many of these questions as we have time for. But at the end, we'll be sending everyone who registered a copy of the recording, as well as a transcript of the questions we didn't have time to answer. Included in that recording will also be the more full resolution versions of what we're showing as we are doing this over Zoom. Uh, so some of the content may be a little bit more choppy than we intend. So with all that said, I'm going to pass it over to Michael O, and we can get this webinar started. Great. Uh, thank you, Adam. And it's uh, good for everyone to join us for this Boston Design Week uh, event about next-gen design tools. Uh, just a quick little uh, blurb about who TSP is. We were founded about 29 years ago, um, and uh, we've started in the IT space, but uh, actually now work in lots of different areas where technology and design intersect. So we do smart home design for projects both in Boston, as well as all over the country, and even in Iceland, we do commercial AV work. Uh, we've done work once again in the US and in uh, across the seas in the UK uh, for clients uh, like SL Partners there. That's a, a photo from them. And we also have a design consultancy that works in larger projects, not just implementation, but really um, helping advise um, designers, architects in technology. So we do smart building consulting. That's the 10 World Trade project in the seaport that we're working with Sasaki and BGI on that project and also working in the MDU space. So helping with technology for condos, luxury condominiums um, and multi-dwelling units all, all over. So we have a lot of different hands in a lot of different areas around technology, around design. Um, and we, we've come across a, a lot of things, a lot of technologies, and we've sort of put this together in today's presentation. Now, we're not architectural workflow experts. We're not here to, to tell you how to change or run your firm and, and how, you know, how to do things differently. What we wanted to do was really just introduce and hopefully open your eyes to some of the new trends that are happening uh, in this space because it's moving so, so quickly. Um, and so, you know, it, you know, hopefully you'll find this, this time, you know, very useful um, and we'll dive right in and, and talk about three different tools. Um, but first I just wanted to set the stage a little bit and, you know, I, I, can sort of describe what's going on today in the world of visualization, real-time rendering as almost a product of what I'd call the metaverse generation. So the metaverse is just another word for alternate universes, alternate realities. But in the world today, that's all video gaming, right? I mean, every a lot of the video games that are out there, you know, from uh, Minecraft to Fortnite are, are in worlds that are being rendered on, uh, you know, in, in real time. And you know, there's a lot of technology that's gone into that. Of course, maybe that is or isn't uh, sort of uh, useful to architecture and design, but we're finding that it is becoming more and more relevant. And it's relevant in a couple of different ways. I mean, first off, Minecraft, you know, which is probably one of the first kind of like blank slate, build your own world, very popular, 131 million active users. That was first released in 2009. And, and what that means is that, you know, you have people and, and kids, maybe they're six years old and picked up, you know, their, their first mobile device. I mean, this is also at the time of the mobile device boom, uh, the gaming, um, mobile gaming uh, boom also happened. And, you know, over that course of 12 years, they were immersed in these different alternate universes. And those kids are now 18. They're starting to, to learn about the real world, starting to find professions. And the reality is quite a few people, their introduction to architecture was through gaming. You know, they're able to go into a world, blank slate, create, find, uh, find some materials, um, create buildings, cr 
create environments all on their own and, and without the constraints of the real world, right? Without the constraints of physics, without the constraints of project management, you know, they're able to create all of these worlds in, in, in hours, if not minutes. Um, and, and there's something about that creativity that, that sort of comes with the, the, you know, having a blank slate, having this metaverse that you can play in. And, and it has started to bleed over. I mean, even Bjork Engels, you know, of course, uh, part of a very prominent Bjork Engels group um, architecture firm in Denmark has been quoted to say that architecture should be more like Minecraft, not that it should look like it. We certainly all agree on that point, but more that it should have that creativity and interactivity uh, that Minecraft allows and, you know, all of these other video games. Um, and I think that attitude of, you know, a, a whole generation of people coming into these different professions with a whole different set of tools and technologies. And that's really, you know, what we want to talk about today. And really, you know, our, all three of these play in this idea around virtual worlds and the real world. But of course, it's all about the real world in terms of architecture and design. Um, but how can we communicate things maybe that don't exist, maybe exist in our minds or that we as, as designers are trying to get out there, you know, to the clients uh, or, you know, in, in other ways. So we'll start with a very straightforward tool called Matterport. You may have seen this, especially if you've uh, done any buying of, of uh, a home recently. It's a very popular platform in real estate. Um, it's also very popular. There's another platform called uh, Listings 3D, um, but does very much the same thing. And, and of course, Matterport captures spaces virtually. Um, so, you know, you're looking for a, a home, you can walk through that home. Different versions of this of technology have been around for a long time, but they really seem to have, have gotten a lot of traction in the real estate space. And part of the reason is the development of consumer cameras like the one that's that I have here and that's on screen. That's the Ryko uh, Theta Z1. There's a version of it that's a little bit lower in resolution. That's $500. This camera is $1,000. And you know it may sound expensive for what it is, but as a professional tool, it's it's really nothing, especially for the value that we get out of it, that people get out of it. And it means that you can capture a space, a room in minutes, uh, a seven thousand square foot house, maybe in an hour or two, um, going through the space and and basically just using your phone and using this camera to capture the space. Um, and it really captures everything like a snapshot in time. I mean, I think we've all been in a situation where we go on site, we take photos of things that we think that matters, but we walk away and we realize uh, two or three days later, we have the wrong photos. We need a detail on the ceiling or on the floor or something we didn't anticipate. And doing these captures with Matterport just, uh, you know, makes that problem go away. Everything's captured. And if you spend the time and you walk through a place like that, but for us, the way that we've changed and flipped the script on Matterport is that we've gone from three dimensions into the fourth dimension, which is time, where we're capturing this as part of the build process. So I'm going to hand it over to Aaron and I'm going to bring up a couple of Matterports um, and he's going to walk you through how we use this, you know, at TSP. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. And hello, everyone. So uh, as Michael mentioned, this is, this is probably the more simple, it's certainly the least novel of the technology we're going to be looking at today, but because I am the least technical person on the panel, I'm going to be presenting the least technical, uh, technically complex um, software or, or program that we use. Uh, and we're still excited about it because it's become a huge resource to, to TSP and the partners that we work with. So this first project that Michael's going to walk us through uh, is a super fun one for us. It's a bowling alley in a residential edition that we're showing here in the rough and uh, rough and stage. And underneath all of this, as I'm sure you imagine, is a lot of technology and mechanical infrastructure. And it's really vital that we capture as much of it as possible in as many phases or stages of the project as possible. While we at TSP tend to focus on elements like low voltage cabling, uh, lighting, anything to do with audio visuals, uh, this, these captures, you know, other work as well, such as plumbing, uh, other wiring, details like blocking, uh, and anything essentially that's visible to the camera. And as Michael spins around, you may notice these call-out tags throughout uh, that we use liberally uh, to, you know, indicate what wall control is going to be, where that's at. Uh, automatic shades in the case of this particular project from Lutron. 
invisible speakers. These are all elements that we have on paper in some other format and drawings in 2D, uh, but there's really nothing better than this type of uh, a file to look for placement of things within framing, for instance, or again, blocking that type of thing. Um, and, and while we use this before pre-pandemic, I would say, you can imagine how much more useful it's become to us since we can effectively walk through with homeowners or other you know, team members to review placements of different uh, elements, such as uh, invisible speakers, um, temperature sensors, those types of things, and even talk about new system features or scope changes with, a, with really good backing context that you get from this. We're gonna go on to another uh, project as well. And just to uh, reiterate what Michael said about the cameras, you don't need to invest uh, $8,000 or, or more into a camera really to get the value out of 3D image capture. Uh, we got by with a much more economical camera and you could get something, you know, and, and, and do a great job with something as low as $60. So it really, it really is open in terms of what you can, what you can pull off. Um, this next project is another fun one that we are Super excited about, and we're still in the in the middle of. Uh, very grateful to be a part of. It's a uh, very historic home uh, in Boston, uh, turn of the century addition to a Victorian era mansion in this particular space. And we were brought in to drastically improve the lighting in the in the in the home and the space in particular, uh, while paying some sort of reverence to its 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 uh, historic, you know. Uh, preservation and heritage. Because the, the architect, the, the team that was actually brought in to, to uh, help design lighting, we, we outsourced some of the lighting design and expertise in this, in this particular project. Some of that team is UK, UK based. And because of that, and the fact that we began uh, design concepts for this project in the height of the pandemic, uh, 3D image capture is really the only way that we were able to assemble the team that we did uh, to the point where one of the international team members that we have has never worked on a project uh, of this sort uh, without having stepped foot in the place. And that's something that he chose to do because of our trust and the ability to collaborate with 360 imaging. So we feel really fortunate uh, that we were able to pull it off. Um, of course, Matterport doesn't truly replace what it means to be live and in person, uh, but it does allow for more realistic perspective than you would get from static photos. So we can really get a better sense of the space, a better perspective of the space than we can with photos. And it also allows team members uh, throughout to, to um, access this file, add uh, call out tags, or even take measurements, uh, rough measurements we wouldn't necessarily order, you know, uh, our, our product from, from these measurements or wallpaper or what have you, but um, they are good enough to, to help out, uh, as you know, measurements and uh, are super important to the lighting design process. But we have call out tags here um, for items like architectural lighting, which is the bulk of what we're doing in this particular space. Um, invisible ceiling, uh, invisible speakers in the ceiling, even a a uh, custom commission gas fireplace pan that we that we've uh, worked on for this particular project. So uh, there's a lot that we can uh, have access to and 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 items that we need quite valuable for us to get our jobs done. Um, I think we can move on from this space into the main foyer of the house just to show you a little bit more about how we use this. Again, more call out tags in this particular case. We're focusing a lot in this home on a retrofit improvement to update lighting and wall control. Uh, in this particular case, six or five or six gangs of wall control we're trying to reduce to one wherever possible, or at least the, the lowest amount. And having this file ready to go, particularly as we have clients who have multiple homes or who are away for any length of time, uh, we can you know, walk through with them and really discuss our approach to what's maybe going to happen in their house. Um, it really does allow us to have some really important conversations early on. Old house, as you know, beautiful as it is, lots of surprises. We have lots of good intentions, can't always do what we want, um, but we can really talk that out uh, via uh, you know, this type of means and the homeowners really, really appreciate what we're able to do. Uh, and it's, in terms of practical uses, I mean, I've sh showed you a lot of what we do. 
and what, how this really affects our work, but something as simple as a stain on the carpet. Uh, this particular file picked up um, that a stain had been uh, around for a year before uh, some contractors were doing work uh, on the property and they really were grateful to TSP to be able to pull up an old file and say, yes, that stain was not put there by you, at least not this time. Um, so it's it's super it's super practical um, and I and I hope that you get to uh, use it if you haven't already. Thanks, Mike. Great, thanks, Aaron. Thanks for that little tour of Matterport and how we're using it into uh, not just uh, the, the one-time captures, but like with the bowling alley, we're really able to capture it multiple times. You know, one of the challenges with the pandemic is that we really couldn't go on site as often as we would normally in a, in a project where we're managing the build. Um, and what this allowed us to do is maybe take a much smaller team uh, or one person, find a time we can go in and take that capture and then uh, you know, share that amongst the team and discuss things without not everyone having to be there, which was really key. So, you know, a lot of these technologies have come to their forefront, um, particularly around um, you know, COVID. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's you know, a, a silver lining on, on, uh, on the pandemic. Um, but uh, let's move on to something that's a little bit different. So, of course, as we talked about with, with Matterport, it's great with capturing physical spaces that exist and then making them virtual, right? I mean, it's in some ways you may have heard the, co the concept of the digital twin. Well, Matterport is making a digital twin of an existing space, but what about spaces that don't exist? So how, do you, how can you take the vision of a space that you're creating as an architect or designer and really being able to kind of get that in front of the client in a way that, that works. Now, of course, renderings are the traditional way of doing that in today's um, world. But um, what we found is that there's a, a use for another set of tools called re, uh, real-time rendering. Um, some leaders in that field are Twinmotion, Lumion, uh, Enscape as well who are able to um, bring rendering to new parts of the design process. Now, I'm not here to say that these tools are gonna to replace the existing rendering workflows. I mean, of course, as, as many of you who might work within architectural firms know, there's three primary ways that rendering is done. Either if it's a small firm, you're sort of doing it yourself, you're kind of having to learn those rendering tools. Uh, if it's a larger firm, you might have people within the, the, uh, the, the firm that specialize in rendering, or the alternate is to farm that out to a third party that specializes in uh, you know, high quality renderings. And, and those things take hours, if not days, you know, for all, all the details to be rendered. And, and as an end product, you know, where you're really demonstrating to the client, this is really what their, um, their, their, their property is gonna look like, their home or, or a commercial you know, building that isn't going to go away necessarily. But what we found is real-time rendering opens up new parts of the design process where you can use a rendering to help, you know, communicate certain things, communicate choices, give people a real sense of, you know, what, what choices can be made in, in the design process and guide them through that. Now, Twin Motion is based on the Unreal Gaming Engine. So once again, this concept of the metaverse, these sort of alternate universe, uh, universes that are created for entertainment, well, they're just applying that same technology to the real world. So can, you know, I'm sure at some point they ask themselves, can we apply this to actually doing renderings of what's really out there? Um, and, and once again, you know, we found within the, the pandemic and, and with these virtual tools really coming to the forefront, they become much more prominent. So Twinmotion can import 3D files from SketchUp, Revit, other standard sort of CAD and uh, BIM products, uh, and then you know we'll, we'll bring them in. And and within those files, then you can create context. You can even you can even open up interactivity. Um, you can put on a VR headset and have somebody walk through a space, you know, with these things. But I think it's all best demonstrated. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a video which has been pre-recorded in real time. So no, no tricks, no compression, uh, no cuts. Um, it's me doing this uh, twin motion project and I'm gonna narrate. It's just impossible for me to do it and narrate at the same time. So <clears throat> we're gonna start with the basic twin motion 
uh, interface and I'm importing in a SketchUp file. Now this SketchUp file is a project that we're working on in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, Catalina Architects is the architect on this. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an incredible project, but you know, as you're going through uh, the design process, you know, you may want to communicate certain elements without having to go through that, that costly and time consuming rendering process. And this is where Twinmotion really shines. So here's the SketchUp file. Obviously, it's not been um, particularly optimized for real for any any sort of rendering. I mean, it's the, all the basics are there, but SketchUp, uh, you know, does its job with vegetation, um, very static, very unrealistic. Um, and so we are simply just going to make some adjustments to remove the elements, which really kind of add that sense of unrealism to uh, to a, a, a you know a, a rendering. Um, you know, it's sometimes called the uncanny valley where the human mind is so good at picking up these details that anything that throws it off from what really looks real, you know, makes it sort of not really register it as, as something that, that it engages with. And that's really where twin motion excels is taking a basic file like this and then starting to apply layer after layer of uh, these details. So I've selected a few uh, textures, sort of favorite materials that I've used for this project on the left. That's pretty much the only sort of Julia Childs thing I've done with this of pre-positioning -pre that. Everything else is being done in real time. And this whole video is gonna take maybe another 15 minutes um, and we'll show you really what, what happened. So the basics of Twin Motion is you start by taking that file, you, ex you take out the unrealistic elements and then you start applying your texture. So I'm taking, various textures that I like, that I use, and I'm applying them to all the different elements of, uh, of the house. And you'll see as I'm applying them, there's not a radical difference. You know, simply adding, you know, a steel beam to that particular architectural detail um, in itself doesn't radically change. But when you add all of these things together, then you start to get a lot of, of really interesting effects. So <clears throat> I'm applying slate roof, to the and, and I'm rescaling that so along the bottom you have the ability to change the color reflectivity the scale of the materials um, if it's weathered or not there's there's a, a bunch of different sort of things that you can do I'm gonna also apply a stone pavement to the, the outdoor flooring once again adjust the scale accordingly And, but you can still see that there's a lot that's unrealistic about this, right? You've got this sort of default city in the background. You have kind of what looks like a little bit of brick as kind of the surround. So I'm going to take <coughs> take that and put it in a desert sand, um, you know, redo the gravel. And, you know, the, the focus here is not to recreate the universe, right? I mean, this is just one house. What I'm trying to do is just take elements around the rendering areas. I mean, the places that I'm going to show off some assets to the client. So I'm gonna create a video or I'm gonna create a few photos. Uh, I need everything in that photo to kind of have sort of contextual completeness so that it, it, it engages with the user. <clears throat> but I don't, I don't have to recreate the universe here. But what I do wanna do is recreate some of the vegetation, some of the planting. So you can see that the agave plants that I'm putting in from the Twin Motion Library, they're not just cut and paste exact same versions of the same plant. As I'm creating them, it's it's creating slightly different sizes, rotations, slightly different leaf patterns, and that's one of the powers of Twin Motion um, and the vegetation that it has. So I'm going to add a couple palm trees. The other thing, the Twin Motion, it's aware of how trees and bushes and 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 things grow. So it's not just simply taking a simple model of a tree and just scaling it up or down, which of course doesn't really lend itself. A palm tree doesn't look like that when it's a, a baby palm tree. Um, and it, so it knows that and you can adapt that. So I'm going to change the background as well, make it something more mountainous. And you can see as we're going through this, now we've added these trees, the shadows are being rendered in real time, very much like a video game. Uh, but if you compare this against sort of traditional rendering workflows, it's completely different, very interactive, um, being able to just basically see what you're doing as you go along. So next I'm going to do what's called vegetation painting. Um, and that's a simply just taking a few pieces of like, let's say dry grass and dry wild grass, and I'm going to mix them together and essentially use a paintbrush to take, get rid of some of these hard edges. And once again, as I choose my rendering angles and locations, 
it's going to you know show some of that stuff in the background so i just want it not to have these sort of fake and kind of artificial hard edges i'm going to add a little bit of grass just some color here for the uh the back garden uh, clearly i could spend a little bit more time and trim that out to be exactly the location that i want but you know in this case we're, we're doing this for a quick demo next up we're going to go and look at this pool of water so you know like you would imagine in many landscapes you have sort of a a, a rust um a rusty metal container and it's going to have some water in it this looks very flat very fake right now with um with uh coming from sketchup uh, i've added a water element to it so that allows me to define the water depth uh, i'm going to change the color to just make it a little bit more visible um, and you can already see that there's a lot more uh, of, of a rendering of something that's that's more lifelike there. So I'm going to change the angle a little bit and zoom in on it. And you're going to see something very similar to the rendered you know, image that we have you know, for our promotional stuff for this talk. And this is all happening in real time. So you see that water, the reflections, it's reflecting all of those textures, the light. I've accidentally dipped the camera in the water there. Luckily, this is all virtual. Um, and it's and it's all rendering that you know as, as you go in real time and I mean and and that power of being able to kind of put these different contextual elements in there that create realism is really where twin motion you know excels. Now I'm going to just create a little bit of patio furniture and replace what the very static uh, you know stuff that came from uh, SketchUp. I'm just adding some things from the standard twin motion libraries. There's tons of third party libraries that you can pull from as well. You can even pull in your own models if you want to um, and, and apply textures to them. These are just some basic outdoor chairs. But one fun thing I'll do is just add a wine set. So once again, this sort of interactivity, I'm going to take uh, this wine set, which is actually made up of three different elements. Uh, and let's zoom in a little bit. And I'm gonna look at, let's say this wine glass, I wanna make some extra wine glasses. So I can do that and add a bit of, of, of life to this scene. I mean, it looks a little bit more lived in. It looks like there've been, been people hanging out, drinking some wine. Um, and, and all of those little contextual elements help to take you away from that uncanny valley where you're no longer believing, you're sort of disbelieving what you're seeing in front of you and allows the the client to really enter the metaverse, right? I mean, you're, you're creating a universe that is in your imagination as the designer or architect and you're drawing them into that. We moved inside and for the purposes of, of this demonstration, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the inside. I'm basically just gonna adjust some of the materials here just to make them a little bit more you know, realistic. And my focus for the purpose of, of these renderings is to do some renderings from the outside. But as we are going to do a video that's panning around the outside of the house, I do want some of the in, inside elements to look a bit more realistic. So I'm taking a TV. So I removed once again, a very flat and static uh, item from SketchUp. I'm putting in a TV from the Twin Motion Library. I'm going to resize that. You can see there's already a better reflectivity on that screen. You know, it's, it, it recognizes that that's glass um, and, you know, I basically sort of position, I think, what the right TV size is for that area. And you can use that to sort of interact with people, you know, with that. And here's a little trick that Twinmotion is really good at is mapping a video file to a texture. So I can map that video to the TV and I'm actually even adding a little bit of glow to that video to simulate an LED backlight. And you'll see that that video plays in real time as I'm interacting with the space. And you can make that video whatever you want. So whatever is going to engage the client, you know, it, and, and really as we just use it to show when, when you have a video that there's action, there's a sort of movement, this isn't just static. Next up, I'm putting on the lights, right? And so we're using IES standard sort of light patterns, which are built into twin motion to simulate recessed lights. And I'm not a lighting designer, but I'm simply just putting in a few lights where it's already been positioned for this particular project. And you can see that once again, as I'm adding the lights, Twin Motion is rendering that in real time. It's showing how the, that light is interacting with all those all of those materials, the other lights in the space. <clears throat> it's calculating all of that stuff as as it goes. It really shows you the power of of that rendering engine that comes from Unreal. Uh, and then I'm going to do the same for these wall washers where, you know, clearly they're going to have a slightly different effect. 
So I'm going to angle the lights, you know, a, a bit more appropriately to what what the intent is there. Uh, and then I'm going to duplicate that across as well. So I mean, wh what are we like seven, eight, nine minutes into this, um, and we've already created, you know, a, a much better, more compelling space in terms of being able to communicate things. Within the lights, you, if you look across the bottom, you have the ability to adjust things like the intensity uh, of light. So now I've grabbed all the lights and I'm just toning them all down. You can change the color temperature, which for those of you that are doing lighting design or working in architecture where you interact with lighting design, color temperature is hugely important um, for communicating and conveying the right look for a space. Um, and, and there's so much you, you can do with twin motion to communicate that. Um, you can even do RGB lighting and all that stuff as well. Moving to the outside of the space and just going to add some lights here. Once again, I'm not a lighting designer, but just to sort of demonstrate the potential of uh, twin motion. So we're going to add a couple, you know, presumably waterproof, waterproof recesses, you know, into um, the outside here. Uh, tone down the intensity, and I'm basically just going to take that and duplicate it um, so to give it a sort of a nice look. Next, I'm going to take what's called an area light, which basically gives you a rectangle of light. Um, but if you adjust the dimensions on this, so make the length really small and the width very large, you know, to, to equivalent to that steel beam, I'm able to simulate an LED, a linear LED. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to adjust the angle of that light so it's uh, appropriate. So now, now it gives you that same look as a linear LED in a, in a recess waterproof recess once again obviously for outside you know this would be something like a, a cluse or an acolyte you know the type of fixture that you'd, you'd put in a in a scenario like that and i'm going to take that and, and basically simply copy and paste that across so whatever's whatever's in your imagination however you want to play with lights within these spaces planting furniture you know you're able to do that very very quickly in a way that is much more difficult to do in, in more traditional terms uh, and tools. I'm even going to put in a, an up light here just to sort of experiment with, well, how does that really kind of uh, look on the wall? Of course, I'm doing all of this in a representation of daylight. So you're, you're going to have a, a completely different effect in the nighttime, but just simply, you know, adjust that light and rotate it 180 degrees. And then what I'll do is just simply go through and turn those lights off because <clears throat> we don't want those, you know, during the day. So that's kind of my scene that I've created. There's there's not much else that that um, you know I, I want to do with the actual objects, but what I can do now is change the environment. So within Twin Motion, I can adjust um, so many elements of the world around me, and this is really the power of that Unreal Gaming Engine. I can change the time of day. So you can see that the the sun moves, the shadows move. Uh, it gives me a north orientation. I can take the entire house and orient it the correct way for um, for the actual plot. I you know I've gone into nighttime here, and I'm going to adjust it once again back to that angle that we've used before. You see the reflecting water. So, well, why don't I turn on the outside illumination now? So I put in those extra lights, I turn those off for daytime. I'm gonna select them all and I'm just gonna turn them on. All right, and then suddenly you can see that effect of the linears, of the recessed. Don't really get much of that uh, up light. So we'll have to sort of play around with that, see what, you know, reposition it, see how we wanna play with it. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these captures and basically kind of uh, look at you know, taking snapshots of this angle th during two or three different environmental scenarios. So one nighttime with illumination, we've clearly done that. Well, let's do another one that's daytime uh, you know, and in a different month of the year, right? So the light is gonna be different. The sun position is gonna be different. You can choose that, you can just change that. Um, and then I'm gonna turn off the lights and save that save those conditions for another image, another rendering. I'm going to create a, a, a third one. And let's say that we want a different weather pattern, right? And so Twin Motion says, okay, we want it to be a different, you know, we want it to be raining, right? It can even simulate snow in Arizona if you want. But we're going to say, okay, we want overcast skies, 
totally different light, totally different conditions. You can even see the raindrops falling. And we want to take sort of a, a, a photo of that to really give a sense to, to somebody of how a property is going to look, not just in one ideal state, but in, in multiple, multiple times of the year, um, multiple you know, weather patterns and whatnot. And, and you can even take that entire vegetation of the, the landscape, I didn't show it, but you can also elevate or you can grow the plants, bigger, smaller, make them baby palms, uh, adolescent palms, and, and, and change that in the rendering as well. So the last step I'm doing is just going into the make a video section of Twin Motion, and you essentially just work with keyframes. So you take snapshots of the video, and this allows you to um, essentially work as a kind of like a drone, right? So if, if you reposition your camera, you can move anywhere in the X, Y, Z axes and position the camera exactly where you want them. Um, you can change those conditions. And what Twin Motion does is it evolves between the keyframes. It changes things so it makes a kind of a, a, a more continuous um, you know, movement. But also, if you're changing the time of day, you'll see the sun move, you'll see the shadows move, you'll see the weather evolve. <clears throat> All of these factors you can do. And you know, to uh, I think a point that's been mentioned before, I'm not an architectural visualization specialist by any means. I mean, I started out in, in the IT world. So the fact that I can do this is really more, you know, it, it's more a reflection of, of the video game technology of that simple interaction, making the interface is very straightforward, very simple, but yet very powerful. Um, and there's, there's really a tremendous that can be done, uh, a tremendous amount that can be done with a tool like Twinmotion in a very short period of time. So I'm just making a few final adjustments on those keyframes, and, and I'm trying to capture those. I think it took me on this video a couple of times to get this particular part of the video right. But that's what you get for recording, recording in real time. And then I think we, we've almost, we're almost done. So I'm going to evolve it so that the time of day is a little bit uh, different. Uh, and then I'm, I'm also going to turn on or off the lights inside to sort of show you know that, that it's the end of the day and everything's turning off so so i've captured all those different keyframes as part of my rendering um and i think we're pretty much ready to export next so adam's going to show the the video so essentially after that there's about a five minute rendering process and you'll see there's a little bit of jitteriness here and that's due to zoom it's not due to Twin Motion, and we'll give you these files as part of uh, the package of stuff that we send off to all the attendees. So you can open it up and look at it in real time. But you can see how it how it makes all those transitions, makes it very smooth. It's like a drone is flying, not just in three dimensions, but across time, across months, across weather, and and it, it's very compelling to be able to sort of bring in a client, you know, into that journey. And you can use all of those elements. You can demonstrate with these photos, like for instance, what it's like to have uh, outdoor lighting, whether or not they should add it, what type of lighting um, and those types of things. So Aaron, from your perspective as somebody who has done renderings in the past with the more traditional tools, you know, how, how, how did it feel the first time that you saw Twin Motion? Yeah, I was super excited. Um, it's just, it's it's cool generally, but also just super, super practical. Anyone familiar with uh, 3D rendering is well aware of how long the process used to take in years past, how many, how many hours or even days with uh, multiple dedicated rendering machines uh, working on static rendering. And then if you were, you often were unfortunate enough to have forgotten to turn on a texture or a light or something else that wasn't in there. And you had to, you know, go through the whole process again and hope for better results in a day or two. <laughs> um, and, then, and then cloud rendering and outsourcing really helped to improve the situation uh, by saving a ton of time and, and oftentimes, you know, providing better renderings and, and more, more immediately. Uh, but the type of value that Twin Motion offers takes rendering to a whole other level, uh, providing immediate results that allow for extremely efficient collaboration, which is always a big deal for us. Uh, whether you're discussing TV sizes, uh, differences in lighting, such a, an awesome effect that we got to see here. Uh, lighting is such an increasingly vital element of building design, uh, or even you know, which vegetation, which maturity of vegetation to use for landscaping. Imagine you know, the value of real-time kinetic fine-tuning with stakeholders 
homeowners, developers, whatever, uh, we're often only afforded what's an economy of time with decision makers. And this type of technology can save time and efficiently and accurately relay what our design intent is. And that's, that's always what we're looking for. So on to you, Adam. Awesome. Thank you for that, Mike. Uh, thank you for showing us. So we've now really seen the culmination of a few hours of work and then a few minutes of rendering. But what we really want to be moving on to next is what we at TSP are seeing then as the next frontier of collaborative design. And with that, we'll hand it over to Ken and Patrick from Modus VR. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks, guys, for having us. Uh, everything, every, everything you guys have covered so far has done a great job of demonstrating the power of being able to see something, uh, especially before that space exists. And uh, from a client perspective, once they can see what the end project is going to be like, that's often the first time they're really in a position to ask informed questions. Um, and so because of that, the earlier in the process, in the design and sales process, you can bring these visualizations in, the better because they become a powerful discussion platform. And that's really where Modus VR comes into play. Uh, it is a real-time design presentation and collaboration tool. Um, and so really you can think of it more like a high fidelity whiteboard where you're able to quickly sketch out and try ideas, but you're not at the mercy of your own drawing skills. Everything is dimensionally accurate, has a high fidelity look to it, um, but it also has more of an audio video focus. It incorporates a lot of real world products so that uh, all of the stakeholders can participate uh, very early in the process to see how that project is going to come together. And so today, uh, we thought it would be fun to do a, a live demo of a conference room. So Modus is both a resi and commercial uh, product. Um, but given the state of the world right now, we thought it would be fun to uh, start off with an existing conference room that has kind of a pre-pandemic uh, setup to it. And we're going to use Modus to uh, educate the stakeholders on perhaps some things that should be updated. And then in real time, we'll swap out products. We'll swap out a few things to refresh the room to make it more of a post-pandemic type of approach. So I'm going to go ahead and put on my headset. And what you'll see here in a minute is uh, this process. So the screen share, you're seeing a, a Zoom call. And I'll pan back here and you'll see the entire room and we'll have Ken and I believe Michael has also jumped into the room with us. That's right. I'm in the room. So there's Ken in green. Yep. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. And Wonderful. Michael in red. Hello. Wonderful. And quick time check here, Michael, it's 15 after. So how much do we have? About five, maybe About 10 minutes? Five minutes would be great. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move through this pretty quickly, um, but the main thing here is there's multiple ways for the stakeholders to be involved. And this even addresses one of the questions we saw in Q&A. Um, so for example, we've got Michael wearing a VR headset. So in this case, he'll be one of our stakeholders, but also the other stakeholders could be participating over screen share, like all of the participants in the webinar right now. They're able to watch this and in a normal environment, they'd be able to communicate. Um, but what we'd like to show is just a couple of issues here. So this, this room, we call it pre-pandemic in that it is laid out with the intent of people to be meeting in person. Um, they're all going to be looking across the table from each other. And then any type of video conferencing is more of an afterthought, right? There is a screen, there is a camera here, but it's really not optimized for it. And so the very first thing we're going to do to help illustrate that point is show our field of view indicator for this camera. And so understanding exactly what people on the far end of a call will see is critical to understanding their experience. And so very, very quickly here, we can demonstrate what that camera is going to see. In fact, Patrick, how about you fly up here and show everybody that far end view. And I'm going to turn on some fake heads from the Blue Man group just so everyone can really see what that's like. And right away, there's a few problems with this. First, we've, we've got a seat here that's an issue. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. Um, but on top of that, we see all of these chairs here. Let me help you out there, Michael. <laughs> um, all of these chairs here are arranged in such a way that you're really only getting a view of these front two people. And the view itself isn't even very flattering. We're kind of looking up their noses. So there's a few problems. There's the placement of the camera, the type of camera. It's got a very wide field of view. We're getting a lot of wasted space off to the side here. But then even the table itself encourages 
a poor placement of every seat. So I'm going to remove this camera. So Patrick, if you want to back out there, thank you. And I'm also going to delete this table in just a moment after I show one last problem. And that's this microphone. So we can visualize the pickup pattern, the range that this microphone can pick up. And so from a specs standpoint, it is a perfect microphone for this size table. But the problem is this microphone is designed to go at the center of the table when everybody's looking in at each other across the table. But once we're doing a video conference and keeping in mind this new hybrid workforce where as many as half of the workforce might still be at home, many of these calls are now gonna shift from looking across the table to now looking at the screen, which means these front four chairs here are all gonna be facing away from the microphone. So we gotta get rid of that microphone too and come up with something a little bit better. So I'm gonna get rid of that table. I'm gonna swap in a different one. And these are again, are often real world products. So this, this table we're putting in right now is a table from Salamander Designs. They offer many different shapes and sizes. And this is a trapezoid table. And you can see Michael's already rearranging these chairs a little bit so that we can naturally follow that table. And what happens here is it automatically fans these participants out a little bit. So when we toss in a new camera, we'll see that they're not gonna be blocking the view of each other. And so in fact, I'll go ahead and do that right now. I'm gonna to toss in a camera. Uh, we'll do one from Logitech. So Logitech has some really great products and they have one called the Rally Bar. And the Rally Bar is an all-in-one device. It's got a camera, microphone and speakers built into one. Um, and previously we had the camera below the screen, which is not so great because it gives you that unflattering view. Um, but instead with the rally bar, it also supports pan and tilt, which we can also demonstrate in MODIS. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn on that field of view indicator again. And this time we're going to aim it down just a little bit. And Patrick, if you want to jump up and show just the difference in the view already, we've got a much, much better view for those remote participants. And, and especially right now in the world today where we have 50% of the workforce participating this way, it is so important that they have a good experience. Otherwise productivity is going to drop. And just with a few small changes, we can help encourage that. So I'm gonna do one other thing really quick here. We have addressed the camera. We've addressed the layout of the, cam of the table here. We also need to make sure the audio is good. We've all been victims of a bad uh, conference call audio experience. And so we're gonna turn on the, the microphone pickup pattern for this rally bar to see how we're doing. And if we look, the first six seats, so about the first two thirds of this table are within that uh, spec pickup pattern. But these back three participants are likely not gonna be picked up as well. So we need to augment that microphone just a little bit so we'll add in a second product. This is another uh, product from Logitech. This is the Rally Bar, or the, I'm sorry, the Rally Mic Pod. And just like we did with the other microphones, we can demonstrate the pickup pattern for this one. And we'll see very quickly. All right, great. We've now picked up everybody else in the room, but perhaps now somebody, one of the stakeholders says, yes, that's great, but we've got such a clean design now. Do we really want this on the table? Do we have any other options? And this is again where Modus is a wonderful type of whiteboard tool. So we can very quickly try putting this up on the ceiling to see if that pickup pattern works. And as we can tell, it, it sure does. Its range is enough to grab people even when it's mounted up on the ceiling. And I'll even change it to its graphite color to help it blend in a little bit better. And just through a quick demonstration there, we're able to show how just a few minor changes to this room can update it to become more post pandemic. Uh, where we have a hybrid workforce. We want to make sure that people in the room and people on the call remotely are all having a good uh, high quality experience. So we can keep that productivity nice and high. And so again, as we, as we talk about, all right, once we can see things, we need to be able to encourage discussion and collaboration. Uh, when you can bring this type of tool in early on in the process and get those stakeholders together, uh, we can save everybody's time because we can work through these problems in one meeting instead of presenting a possible solution, getting feedback and questions, and then going back to the drawing board for a week, trying to reconvene and align all those schedules. Instead, you can just do it all at once. And that, that's the power of these newer tools that are coming out. 
Michael, do you have any comments or questions you'd like us to cover here? Well, I just, you know, just wanted to point out in terms of the collaboration side of things, you know, I'm in this VR and I'm, you know, basically work, working as an observer, but also as somebody that can ask those questions, like say, well, look, can we have that microphone on the ceiling instead of the floor? And you can show that in real time. And the other piece is like, we're very physically distant, right? I mean, you know, Patrick's in Washington <laughs> State, you're in Utah and I'm in Boston. Um, and basically we're in the same immersive space together interacting. Uh, and I will say, you know, while the, the people on the webinar can't necessarily see it, you know, and, and if you've had this experience with gaming in VR, you do really immerse yourself in it. You get a sense of what the space is like. You get a sense of what, it, what it's gonna be like to move around the table, how much space there is between the TV and the table. If I'm, I'm moving around, if I'm presenting, all of these elements become really obvious. I mean, like, you know, intuitive in the sense that I, I really can put myself in any seat, you know, on the table and see what the view is going to be, be like, you know, from that location. Is the TV big enough? Maybe we need a bigger TV, right? Maybe we yeah. need two TVs. So all of that is stuff that like, let's, let's add do. a second screen. And here's, here's a fun one. Um, you know, a lot of touch screens are becoming a, a, a pretty common thing in these conference rooms. And so when you're sort of physically in the space, you know, we're not really, but it feels like we are, then we can start to get a feel for, okay, is this an appropriate height for me to do a touch screen? Is this cabinet going to be in the way? Is it too deep? Do we need to get rid of it? Once I'm here, am I blocking view of the camera? All those types of things are, are such powerful things that you just intuitively understand by nature of being there in the space. All right, so to, to leave some time for Q&A, should I turn it back to you guys? Yeah, Mike is still on mute from his, uh, hey, there we go. his <laughs> migration from VR. You know, <laughs> we, we got almost all the way through this without, without the, you know, you're muted, the but zoom I, mute. just had to, I just had to do that. Um, so thanks, thanks, Ken and Patrick for that, that demo. Certainly. I mean, I, I, you know, and I think that um, it's somewhat hard to convey, and, and one of the things that, that modus you guys are really good at is is can, is is doing this over zoom so people really can get a, a feel of what it's like but there's nothing like the experience of, of, of doing it in vr and vr hardware so the platform like this where you are rendering in real time you're interacting in real time um, it isn't just the headset we're working with a gaming pc but it's not a particularly high-end one it's the 1500 dollar gaming pc basically just purchased on amazon and you know got shipped hooked up an oculus uh, Quest 2, which is a $300 consumer VR headset. The kids love it because they can play games on it without the computer, but you can use it for work too. And it's it's a fantastic to see this technology and it's evolving so quickly. So, you know, the wrap up for today, I know we only have a few minutes, so we'll give some time for, for Q&A, is really, you know, this is all food for thought. You know, we've already said we're not experts in architectural visualization, workflows, but we think that there's something here which every design firm every architecture firm is going to, you know, be involved in at some point in the near future. Because this hardware, whatever is in that gaming PC will be in the headset within the next 18 or 24 months. You're going to start to be able to have these experiences. And we recommend that as designers, if you're an interior designer, as you're an architect or, 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 or whatever, to, to investigate and look into these things. You don't have to learn the software. Just learn about what it's doing, how it's interacting there'll be a new generation of people entering into the workforce that have a lot more knowledge and, and sort of savviness with this technology and leverage, you know, those people. Because I think it's, it's gonna be a, a really interesting, you know, kind of world in the next year or two, particularly as a lot of these activities have gone virtual and will continue to be very hybrid. So uh, hopefully people have learned stuff and Adam, we can just dive into the Q and A. Yeah, so thank you again to Ken and Patrick. That was awesome. And I'm going to give them a quick plug. Uh, this was a snapshot of how interesting and great this technology is. But please go to modusvr.com to find out more about their technology, including, in this case, a much more Modus-focused webinar on May 20th. Uh, and then as well, if you were someone who did join a little bit, a little bit later and you missed any parts of our presentation or have any colleagues or friends who would be interested in the event, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be emailing you uh, the event video and the full transcript as well as any and all of the questions we touch on today. So the first question that comes from the audience, uh, I know Ken was able to touch on it a bit with 
how modus, but I'll turn it over to Mike and Aaron. But how do you involve the customer in the process of space creation or space design? And then how are you validating with your customers of their specific needs and making sure that the space serves their needs, their wishes? I mean, I'll give my sort of two cents on it and Aaron, you can jump in. I mean, I think that how you're involving the customer into this process is, is, is very much up to you. I mean, we've been investigating this in terms of uh, lighting control, for instance, and how can we give people a sense of what's the value of paying money for good lighting control or even good lighting? So we're a Ketra dealer. That's a much more expensive fixture than an everyday recessed. Um, what's the value? What's the benefit? And if we have showrooms, we can show that. And even pre-pandemic, it was a struggle to get people to go to those places. So being able to show these things virtually, um, either over a Zoom call or um, you know in VR, and that's that's a little bit. It's a it's one step a little bit further removed. I can't just ship a VR headset to somebody um, and then and jump into Modus. But there is you know it's it's very much on the cusp. Um, that, you know, we'll be able to be do, do, doing that type of a, a design process. Aaron, anything else to add there? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we start from a place of, uh, again, collaboration as early as possible and getting to know our clients. So when, whenever we're brought in that early and we have that type of connection, it's always easier for us to figure out how best to approach um, the designs that we work on for our smart systems or smart homes or even commercial spaces. Um, so technology aside, uh, that type of you know, constant indirect communication is, is key. It's much easier to do when we're not working through a third party. Um, and, and then from there, it's really just a matter of what the particular, what the specifics of the project or the challenge require. It changes from project to project. In many cases, especially since, uh, since the pandemic began, we've had no choice but to do a lot of this work virtually. So whether we want to or not, virtual you know, um, solutions are, are sometimes our, our only options. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll hand it over to, to Ken as well. I mean, in, in, in the last part of that question is like, you know, how do you validate with your customers? I mean, it seems like Modus as a platform is basically the whole thing is validating with the customers, right? I mean, the whole point is that you're able to demonstrate and, and validate very quickly on the spot in this sort of environment that they've got the right hardware or not. Yeah, well, and, and it's interesting because validation itself kind of implies a, a slightly different flow where it's like, all right, I'm gonna to put together this idea and then I'm gonna validate it against what you're asking for. Um, but in many cases, it's not that cut and dry, right? The client's like, well, I've got this open space. What do I do with it? Um, and so if, if you are in more of a, a legacy model where it's like, okay, I've got to put together options A, B, and C, and you're kind of stabbing in the dark a little bit, that's a challenge. But if it is more of that whiteboard experience and you can say, well, hey, what if we tossed in a, a, a partial wall here to divide the space? Or what if we used a piece of furniture here to encourage flow? You just kind of riff on ideas and it, it becomes much, of a, much more of a brainstorm solution where you discover the the outcome rather than presenting it and it it completely changes the discussion uh I, i'll use a personal anecdote we used modus when we went to finish my basement as you might imagine and we had this big open space and my wife and i ironically were completely unable to visualize how we wanted to do it um but once we started kind of just dorking around in modus we stumbled on the perfect solution for us and there's no way someone could have just said, hey, we think you should do this. And we would have said, yep, that's it. It was a completely different way of solving the problem. That's great. Uh, another question for you, Ken, actually. Um, in this case, when demonstrating, you were highlighting being able to show the range microphones that can be picked up on or uh, other like the table, can this be used with any products or is there a set list of products that are already created? Yeah, uh, a little bit of both. So the, the Modus library is populated by our team. Um, whatever products are in there are driven by customer requests. So if there's a particular product or manufacturer we haven't worked with yet, our customers say, hey, can you do that? And we go make it happen. Um, we also rely quite a bit on generic products. So when, when we showed the camera field of view, for example, uh, we also have a generic camera that lets you enter your own specs for that camera. So that way, if, if you've got a particular product that we don't have in the library, 
oftentimes you can just enter the information you care about and it'll work just as well in the Moda system. Awesome, thank you. And this one really goes to Mike as the kind of driver behind a lot of these technologies. What kind of computing hardware is required for your work with Twin Motion? Or I know you were able to speak on the Modus work, but how about Twin Motion? So actually, it's uh, remarkably pretty straightforward hardware. So the uh, Twin Motion video that I recorded was done on the same PC I, we used for the Modus um, demo as well. It's using an AMD Ryzen 5, not a particularly high-end processor. There's plenty of more expensive stuff out there. It's using a, uh, a, um, a GE Force RTX uh, 3060 graphics card, which is the new, relatively new card that was um, released last year, but it's the, one of the lowest end versions of that. So the PC that I was playing with was $1,500 and Twinmotion actually runs on Mac as well. Uh, and, you know, which I know uh, some designers and architects will, are using on a day-to-day -day basis and it runs fine. You know, sometimes you're not getting the frame rates if you don't have a dedicated graphics card. But when I first started to learn Twin Motion, I was doing it on, on a MacBook Pro 15 inch, you know, with pretty standard specs. And when it comes to rendering the output, it renders the exact same output. It may just not be as fluid as you're walking through. And particularly if you're doing things like wanting to walk through on VR, you know, you want higher end hardware. But like I said, you know, the combination of hardware we're talking about using today is about $2,000. And compared to two or three years ago, when people were doing custom VR rigs, four, five, six thousand $6,000 just to get the hardware, it's, it's radically different. And that's, you know, extrapolate forward a couple of years and it, it will be literally in the headset itself. And, and that will be, you know, a completely different experience as well. Awesome. Thank you. So our last two questions for today, the first one, uh, Matterport actually has an app where you can use your phone to record spaces. How does this really differ from the uh, Ryko camera that we mentioned earlier? Um, I'll take that one just because I've done a lot of Matterport captures with this camera. It's about speed uh, in the sense that the iPhone's only going to have a, a very sort of small field of view and you essentially rotate the camera to capture the 360 and it will do the similar to like a panorama where it sort of stitches it all together. With the Ricos, you're able to put it in one spot, capture, put it to the next spot and capture. And you don't have to tell it where in the room it is. Uh, Matterport uses a, a, a system called Cortex AI, where it basically will figure out where the, the next camera frame is. As long as it's close enough that a lot of the same elements are in it, then it figures out the, the physical dimensions. So you can actually take a camera like this and create a floor plan without actually having to do a single measurement. And of course, it's not gonna be dimensionally accurate to be able to order things, but to order a rug or to order a sofa, I mean, those types of things it can absolutely do um, you know, off of, off of uh, the Matterport process, so. Great, and really just to tie up our entire time together, um, how would Twin Motion and Modus work in cohesion with each other? Do you find that using two or more of these programs with clients is more effective than just one? Well, I can, I can talk a little bit about sort of the twin motion side and our perception of Modus and then maybe hand it to you, Ken. I mean, uh, you know, they, they're both in some ways based on the same engine, but sort of in different parts of it. And I think one of the, one of the places where we are currently in the technology is that the tools are optimized for what they're doing. So Modus is optimized for the collaborative experience. Twin motion is optimized for the real-time rendering experience and really focus more on materials and details and, and you know, things, you know, things like vegetation, which, you know, the library isn't extensive, but they're adding more. I mean, one of the things that Unreal has done is really they're, they're, they've bought up companies. Like there's this company called Quixel that does mega scans. So they, they call, they're scans of textures of, of rocks and, and of physical objects that you can literally sort of throw in there. Vegetation's a little bit more complicated because it grows and all that stuff we were talking about. So th that's kind of Twin Motion's focus and Modus's focus is a little bit different, but you know, I think there is a point where these, these tools do start to converge. Ken, what's your view on it? Yeah, I, I mean, from a technical standpoint, they've they've got a lot of the same DNA from a workflow standpoint and the the problems they're hoping to solve. I think that's where they diverge more, uh, and there's definitely room for them to work together, right? So when when you were showing Twin Motion, a lot of it was more of a macro perspective, right? Let's let's show this entire space. Let's see what it's like at night or under weather. Um, whereas Moda says, hey, let's let's dig in deep into this room and figure out some nitty gritty problems that the client's gonna to wanna to be very hands-on with, right? Let's, let's see if there's enough space between 
this entryway and where the biggest chair is, you know, that type of thing. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of room for them to work together where you have these deeper dive sessions in MODIS. Um, and then perhaps when it's time to present to a larger audience, once a lot of the decisions have been made, that's when you can bring in that higher fidelity uh, render that something like Twin Motion can provide. Awesome. Well, I again want to thank uh, both Ken and Patrick from Modus VR for joining us today. And thank you for everybody who was able to take time out of their weeks. I'm sure that you are all just as busy as we have been during this pandemic. So thank you again for attending. Uh, as we mentioned previously, keep an eye out. We'll be following up uh, soon with a digital version of this that you can be able to download, share, be able to see those more high resolution versions of the various renders that we were doing without the zoom effect or anything like that. But if you do have any other questions or have any other comments, feel free to reach out to us. You can find us over on our website, tsp.space. And also check us out over on Instagram, which I will always plug, which is tsp underscore smart underscore spaces. But thank you again for attending and we will certainly be in contact again soon. Bye everyone. Thanks.